Let's examine how ballistic trajectories work by performing an experiment. I am going to throw a ball and videotape it. I use short shutter time so that the ball will be a clear point when I take measurements. Next I grab the frames of each throw and for convenience's sake combine them into the same picture using Photoshop, but this is entirely optional and won't affect the measurements since the camera is stationary. Next I took the measurements from pixel locations using GIMP's measure tool and wrote the coordinates to a LibreOffice Calc spreadsheet. Then I measured myself and assuming I am around 1.8 meters long, that means I can convert the location data in pixels to meters. Also GIMP's measure tool measures pixels from top, so I had to subtract the height from 1080 pixels to get the location from bottom. Then I subtracted the previous value from next for each location in vertical and horizontal location, effectively measuring the change in location over time. This way I got the speed in both directions the ball was traveling, because each image was 1 25th of a second apart, to get the speed from meters per 0.04 seconds to meters per second, I had to divide the speed by the time, thus scaling the speed to meters per second. After doing that to all three throws, I repeated the process for new speed values to get the acceleration. Because of measurement inaccuracy, the speed and acceleration graphs end up noisy, so I took the average of all accelerations and got the following results. The vertical acceleration was around negative 9.5 meters per second squared, and the horizontal acceleration was around 1.1 meters per second squared. We know that the downwards acceleration on Earth is around 9.8 meters per second squared, meaning I got around 3% error from the real value. Not bad using a camera and a tennis ball, and no other sophisticated devices. From measurements we can deduce something more general. Because the rate of change of position is speed, and the rate of change of speed is acceleration, we can see that, because we measure that the acceleration is constant, speed will change linearly, and thus position of thrown object is a parabola, and the position over time can be expressed as a quadratic function. We can integrate the constant acceleration once to get the speed of the object. Graphically, this means that we will find a function that consecutively sums up small rectangles under the constant curve acceleration. This new curve is a line, and its slope is equal to the constant acceleration. This means that the speed will change the constant amount every second. This is quite intuitive. One thing that integration also presents us is the problem that because it is an antiderivative, it means it has to provide a function whose derivative is itself. Because derivatives ignore constant values and set them to zero, we can't know if there was a constant at some point. That's why we must add an integration constant to the end of the new equation. In mathematics this is called an integration constant, but we will call this initial velocity. It is the velocity we give the ball when we throw it. If we want to get the position of the ball, we need to integrate again. This time we integrate the speed. This will be a bit trickier, but hold on. First we recall that integration is the consecutive sum of small rectangles below the curve. If we take samples of each moment and sum them, we get this parabola looking line. We can write the equation again that integral of speed is position. First we tackle the first term. As we know, the area under a straight line is a triangle. Even better, it's a right triangle, which means the area underneath is easy to compute as one half times the product of the cathedi, which in this case ends up being one half times acceleration times t squared. Next, we tackle the constant term. From previous integration, we remembered that constant function gets a straight line as its integral, so we write v0 times t. Finally, we get to add the integration constant that we will dub the initial position of the object. The equation we got ended up being one of the kinematic formulas you can find in your physics textbook. We proved experimentally that those formulas are true indeed. Congratulations for getting this far into the video. Unfortunately, I don't have a cookie for you. But I wish you well and see you next time. Bye.